I was really grateful that um, before we began, we were all in the back. Now, I don't know whether you've ever been in the choir or been a reader or anything like that, but what it's like to stand in the back of the church before the service starts is we're doing this. Okay, is my mic on? Are things straight? Does everybody know what's going on? People are whispering last minute cues. Don't forget to do something or another. It's, it's not exactly quiet preparation for this. <laughs> and that's okay. That's not a complaint. That's just how it is in getting something together. So I was really grateful when Father Jonathan came up to the front and he said, let's take a couple of minutes to pray. And think about, and this was very important to me, think about what the Lord might want to say to you. I went, oh. You see, the, the focus of everything that I've been thinking about for off and on for the past couple of days, three days or so, is, Lord, what do you want me to say to them? That's different, you see. And what do you want God to say to you? And, and so I took him up on it. I got still and I said, okay, Lord, what do, you, what do you want to say to me? Quoted, God quoted back a very, very familiar verse of Scripture. I'm sure some of you know it. It's out of Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, meaning God, and He will direct your path. Now, my response to that was to relax. And that's what I want to key in on. Because first of all, to be able to relax in that kind of promise is to say something about what you believe about God. You see, the scripture only makes sense. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. If you believe that God is a good God, that God is trusted, and that in fact, He knows everything about who you are. Like how we often start the service, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. All desires known from you, no secrets are hid. Either that's good news or that's terrible. <laughs> I think it's good news. And that God is in fact trustable. And therefore I can say, okay Lord, that means I can trust you for the things in my life that I do not understand, that the things in my life that I don't know how to fix, that the things in my life that I wish were different, but over which I have no control. Isn't that true for just about everybody in the room? That I can trust you to work out your plan and purpose. And that if there are things you want me to do, you'll let me know. That's exactly the opposite of a life that is focused entirely around management, control, protection, and self-preservation. Because actually that's your alternative. I mean, unless you're something, unless there's something mentally wrong with you, and therefore you're passive about life in general, your only alternative are to either organize your life focused around management, control, and protection, and that you're in fact, your ultimate good is safety. That's what you want more than anything else. You want you to be safe, you want the people that you love to be safe, and if somebody comes against your safety, you want them to get theirs. That's all around management, management and control, you see. That's a lot about what our culture is all about these days. Is highest good, personal control, management, and safety. And one of the reasons for a lot of the anger that's bubbling, bubbling up in our presidential campaigns is that people are furious about the fact that they feel out of control and they don't feel safe. They can't manage their circumstances. They feel helpless and they're furious about that. Right? On your head. <laughs> we get that. We get that. So in the midst of that kind of climate, to try to reaffirm the goodness of God 
Actually, it's all the more important. Jesus in the Gospel reading calls God righteous Father. And those two words, in fact, describe the goodness of God. That He is righteous, and that means He's trustable. He doesn't say one thing and do another. You can count on it. That the words that He has spoken through His Son are true and reliable. That even though they don't always make sense from a human perspective, and they don't, the fact of the matter is God can in fact guide us and teach us the things that He wants to know in a way that allows us to be able to live out the words that He says. All of that can only be possible if our understanding of God is that He is good. Or to use the New Testament phrase, He is righteous. In other words, I can count on Him. He's consistent. He is who He says who He is. Like it says in the book of James, there is in Him no shadow of turning. Meaning, unlike Star Wars, there's no dark side to God. <laughs> He's all light. I am the light of the world. And how that righteousness gets expressed is in tender authority. That's the biblical definition of fatherhood. It's tender. It's compassionate. It is kind. But there's also authority. There's responsibility for what it means to be a father. And you exercise that responsibility. So God, to call God righteous Father, is in fact the summation in two words of the very nature and character of God. Jesus could only go into crucifixion of all things and resurrection unless he believed that God was in fact the righteous Father. Good, trustable, I can count on him, and he's in control. Therefore, he is reliable, and I can, going back to Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all my heart, and lean not on my own understanding, and all my ways acknowledge him, and trusting him that he will direct my path. You see, there's a kind of inner consistency, all of which is based on the good character of God. So I have to ask you, is that what you believe about God? Do you believe that God is trusted? <laughs> that He knows all of who you are? That He loves and He cares for you deeply? And that when He begins to break into your life, what will happen to you is, in fact, according to His good pleasure and purpose. Now, that doesn't mean you're always going to like it. Remember, Jesus is praying this prayer in the 14th chapter of John, and where is he? He is about to be crucified. In other words, what's not happening is after this very lofty kind of prayer, he and his disciples go on a picnic. They live out their days enjoying each other's company. No, not at all. It in fact asks of Jesus the ultimate sacrifice. The same, although we're not saving the world, the same is true for us because trust is in fact an invitation to service, to sacrifice. In other words, entering into this relationship with God where we understand Him to be good and righteous and that He cares for us and that I can rely on Him doesn't mean that I can just sort of sit back in my chair and sort of say, well, you know, God's in His heaven and all's right with the world. No, the world's a mess, right? Therefore, who's going to do something about it? The call to say yes to this God as a righteous father is a call to be available for God to use you in the lives of other people, in your community, among family, friends, neighbors, enemies, the places of business and service. It's a call to be available for God to use you wherever you are. Because you see, Jesus... In, again, in this very prayer, says all of these things about who God is and His prayer for us. And the key 
key phrase is, I desire also whom you have given me, may they be with me and where I am to see my glory which you have given me, so that the world may believe. In other words, for the character and the goodness and the rightness of God to be manifested in the public square, in the places where you live and work and serve, for you and I to be the people that God has called us to be when He calls us light of the world, salt of the earth. That's sacrifice, brothers and sisters. That is not me, me living my life for me. Me living my life for me is in fact symptomatic of a life that's built upon man managing circumstances and personal control. Because I want things to go the way I want them to. And if you don't do things the way I want, that means I need to get in the way and make it happen for, you, for myself. You never ask anybody to do something for you because only you know how to do it the right way. Same thing. <laughs> All of those are symptoms of a life that's built around me trying to get what I want. That is not the Christian life. The Christian life is sacrifice. It's doing things that you never expected God asking you to do. In fact, places where you feel absolutely over your head. But in the midst of that, God teaching you to trust Him in the midst of incredibly difficult and deeply challenging circumstances. Which is why, more often than not, the Christian life and the analogy feels like hanging on to God in the midst of a storm. Talking about God as my anchor. The kinds of analogies that describe, in fact, life as difficulty, and yet, God guiding us and leading us through even the worst of difficulty, that actually is symptomatic of a life that says, I trust God. That He is good. That He is, in fact, reliable. And that He is a good, good Father. Now, I want you to know, this is like an aside. I, I want you to know it's it's taken a while for me to get there. I have a lot of reasons to say that God is not trustable and life is not going to work out well. Some of the parts of my life have been incredibly difficult. God has had to do a work of healing in my life. To teach me, in fact, that who God is is someone different than I assumed Him to be as a child growing up. But the wonder of God is that He actually has the capacity to change our hearts <coughs> and to work in us a trust in His character, this character as righteous Father that we can never attain. You see, if my goal in the midst of all of the difficulties that I've lived through is about trying to make sure I don't get into any more difficulty, that's like falling into my own pit. It's actually preparing for the worst because I can't manage those things. It is, in fact, not possible. But if I believe that God is good and that He is trusted, then I can say yes to Him even in the face of enormous difficulty, even in the face of my own personal mistakes. There is, in fact, forgiveness, healing, and reconciliation. And I can keep going. That is only true because I believe God to be good. And because He is good, He is trustable. He is, in fact, a righteous Father. We're about to enter into the liturgy of baptism and confirmation. Big time commitments are going to be made by those who are presenting those for baptism and confirmation, those being baptized and confirmed, and all the rest of us, as we reaffirm the commitments that we made when we were baptized and confirmed. They are impossible commitments. <laughs> that's why, and I said this to the candidates before the service, that's why your answer is, I will with God's help. Because they're so big. If you actually think through the implications of what you're saying, it sets you on a life course that changes how you live. 
That's why I will with God's help has to be your reply. Anything other than that is just falsehood and boasting. Sure I will. Now that's Jesus in the garden. Lord, even if everybody else leaves you, I will. You know, and of course you heard what happened to you. So I would urge you, first of all, to look seriously at the commitments that are being asked. And to say, as I make those commitments, do I actually believe that God is good and trustable? And that I, in fact, can count on that, even in the midst of difficulty. See, it doesn't mean that life always goes well. Often life is difficult and profoundly tragic. But if I believe that God is good and trustable, that means I can continue to step forward, even in perhaps into some of the worst that life has to offer. Holding on to faith with, as, in an anchor, as with an anchor, but knowing that He will never let me go. It is that kind of trust that opens the door for healing within us. For mercy imparted to us. Because God is more than willing to give it. And even if the best you can do is say, God, I don't know what I actually really believe about you, regardless of what I might say. But teach me, open my heart to who you really are. He will take that closed fist inside of you and me and slowly but surely begin to open the fingers so that there is room in us to be able to receive what He, because He loves us, so deeply wants to give. So on this Sunday, when we're thanking God for the sacrifice of Mother as we're thinking about baptism and confirmation, which also is in fact a commitment to sacrifice. Do you believe God is good? And that even when He asks of you very hard things, He will give you what you need? That He is righteous? That He is trustable? And that He will never let you go? If so, this is a service of great joy. And if not, know that as you give Him the closed fist in your heart, He will open those fingers. If you ask Him, and begin to change the heart of stone, and make it into a kind of tender heart that will allow you to say, yes, He is good, and I can trust Him. Amen.